Welcome to the podcast that explores mysterious disappearances, bizarre worldly occurrences, strange phenomenon, and basically everything that's weird. Welcome to the podcast, Everything That Is Weird. I am Anthony, I'm here with Brandon, and we are your hosts. And tonight, we are talking about walking with the tall whites. Right. This is like the story of uh, dances with wolves, except with ants. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting. Mm-hmm. It really is. It, it really is. is. Um, so this... Okay. Well, let's just say, let's just start from like where I've heard about it. Um, I heard about it like a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's 2020. Um, it was like a, a documentary. I was actually looking for Bob Lazar stuff. Right. And I came across this. Hmm. Um, but this guy. He's a nuclear physicist. Is that what? Yeah, he was. He was born and raised in rural Wisconsin, which it sounds redundant. I don't know why right. you have to put rural in front of yeah. Wisconsin if you've ever been to Wisconsin. <laughs> you know, not the giant city that's there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that one city, and then everything else is rural. Well, it's funny. My my buddy played for the Packers. Oh yeah, and he's like, dude. There isn't one building over four stories there. Right. And I'm like, are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, Lambeau Field's in the middle of a subdivision. Right. It is. <laughs> it is. Like, I've seen it. Like, the people that have houses there, they get these little yeah. teeny subdivisions. And they won't sell You can them. see the stadium right behind them. <laughs> they just won't sell them. Uh-uh. They, took, they took really good care of them. Like, it's like yeah. Because they, they, I think they did something to them where they tried to get them out of there. Right. So they, like, made all these mandates about how their yards and stuff had to look. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he's, 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 uh, He's from, you know, I went up to Wisconsin once and we were on a trip with a bunch of buddies of mine and I didn't even realize it at the time, but you know, the show making a murder. Yeah. I was like 15 minutes away from that junkyard. Oh, really? Yeah. And I had no idea. We were staying like 15 minutes down the road. I was like, damn, I would have have loved to just do a little cameo drive by. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> but anyway, so and it, was, guy, it was pretty close to that time. So anyway, he yeah he goes and he enlists in the Air Force back in '64, and he got stationed at Nellis Air Force Base, which is like right outside Las Vegas. You would know, but right outside Las Vegas, it's like literally sitting on the edge of Las Vegas. So and, his uh, name his name is Charles James Hall. Correct. And yeah, this is right around the Vietnam War time. Mm-hmm. But before he actually goes to Vietnam. Um, he he's stationed there. Yeah, he, for a little over two years. So one of my friends in Los Angeles used to be a weatherman, and I was like, "Dude, that's the easiest gig ever, right?" I mean, like, <laughs> what? Especially let me, out let me guess. Let me guess. Seventy-five, partly cloudy at the beginning of the day, and then <laughs> sunny the rest of the day. That's yeah, right. and. Yeah. uh but actually he actually jokes about this he's like how much weather is there in the desert but it's kind of true and so he he says like where he was was kind of like the back end of area 51 yeah it's if you look on the, the google earth um indian springs where this gunnery range was supposed to be would be like right below rachel right which is right and, by area 51. So we'll get into we'll get into your vacation in a minute because I we'll, we're gonna talk about this. I want to talk about the desert. Yep. I fucking love the desert. Okay. Right. So uh, anyway, so he's out there, and as as soon as he gets out there, he said he meets this guy from Los Angeles who's like his, I guess it's like his superior or trainer, basically the guy that's like mm-hmm. he's he's like kind of coaching him into. 
like his role and what he's doing, right? Yeah, he's supposed to show him how to be a, a weather observer. And like right off the bat, they say, well, watch out for Range 4 Harry. And it's kind of like this urban legend. Yeah, it's like as soon as he gets there. Yeah, they, they were giving him. He thought they were just riding him, giving him a hard time for being the new guy. Right. And he, uh, so this guy... He's incredibly interesting, but at the same time, he can put you to sleep. Like, it's, <laughs> he can. He can. He, God, he has interesting stories. He does. But like, at the same time, it's like listening to an old family member talk, and you're just like, <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, I, he I've clearly grew this. up in the 50s. Yeah, right. right you know what I mean? Right. By the way, he talks. So they start talking about Range 4 Harry, which. They kind of talk about as a, a radioactive horse. Yeah, a glowing white radioactive horse that flies over the desert. Right. So, right. So he thinks that's funny. But anyway, he goes out for like his training day or whatever. Mm-hmm. And this guy takes him out there. And there's four weather shacks. Mm-hmm. Range one through four. And they're supposed to go out and see them. And so like back to like my friend being... In uh, yeah, you know, a weatherman in LA, but it's kind of the same thing in the desert. Like it's the same every day, right? Yeah. But I think what's important for like Nellis or Area Fifty One, and we talked about this in our previous things, and not not really so much. Well, maybe in the Bob Lazar one, but like like they probably need to know wind direction. Um, yeah, that's d- a- definitely like Dugway Proving Ground one, because like if you're off on that. Like, maybe you test some, like, biological weapons, and then it drifts over and kills, like, 200 sheep. Like, all right. And we're also talking about 1964. So there right. wasn't, like, all this radar and internet and computers. Everything had to be visually checked and logged by hand. So Sure, and they were literally using, like, weather balloons. and Exactly. And they, they needed to see cloud cover, stuff like that. And right you know, wind direction and so he t- he said that he had like a, a high capacity for mathematics so they send him with with this guy who he he kind of described as like this this Hollywood cowboy type of guy <laughs> yeah, like, you know, yeah you he know he's real just close good to looking dude. handsome <laughs> yeah right, right just like good looking dude yeah you know uh, the weatherman and uh, so they go out there and he said they're driving out there and they're in like a pickup truck. And he's like, as they kind of get closer, he starts like slowing down. Mm-hmm. And he's like, at first it's like, okay, you know, he's like, because there's nothing around us. We're on like a gravel road. Right. And he's like, but then, you know, we're going like 30 miles an hour and mm-hmm. then like 20 miles an hour. And then he's like in first gear. And uh, they like, get to the weather shack and he said the guy just was like, like extremely afraid. Is yeah. the best way. He said he was palsied with fear, is what he said. Yes. Which is a very 1950s right. comment. <laughs> it kind of shows us that that's how he talks. It's... Right. But you can imagine he's just like paralyzed with yeah. fear. Right. So and he's it, just like, he's like uh, not even like with it. He he asks him for the key. He asks Charles for the keys to the shack. Right, and then he's like, locked up. And he's, he's like, like "Oh, look, I don't have it." So he's like, starts patting himself down, and he's like, uh, "Did you did you get it from the cooks?" And he's like, "Why would the cooks have the key?" Right? right. He's like, "Fuck it with him." He's yeah. like, "Okay, uh, winds from the northwest," and he starts like basically making up the weather report. Right? Yeah, he's he's and he's get Charles starts picking up on it after at a, after a second. You can tell he was messing right. with him at first when he was patting his jacket. He wasn't looking for them fucking keys. He was <laughs> he was trying to get out of there. So he's like, "What do you think? Winds out of the southeast for four miles an hour? All right, feels about four miles an hour, right?" And then they get yeah, I tail it out of there. And but he's like, "I want to see the other ones," mm-hmm. and he's like, "Ah." <laughs> right? Yeah, and he's like, I tell you what, wasn't there a specific one he was really spooked to go to? Four, 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 because yeah. it was further back in. Mm-hmm. But they didn't make it there; they went to two. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, I tell you what, I'll stay here. You go there. You go up to. The, <laughs> you go check out the weather shack. 
mm-hmm. if I see anything, I won't leave you here. I will come back for you. <laughs> yeah, it's so, a weird like, thing to say to somebody. Right. So, like, I, I, conf- I confess, I had to listen to, I usually don't do this, but I had to, I had to listen to a few videos of other people that, because it's kind of hard to sift through, like, all, all this information. But this one guy's like, anytime somebody's like, you know, don't think I won't come back for you. You know, just stay there and we will come back for you. He's like, I wasn't thinking that until you said it. Right. Yeah. Because that implies that you're going to drive the fuck away if something yeah, does happen. Right. But don't worry, you'll be back. <laughs> yeah, right. To either help me or collect my body. It's, it's seriously ominous. Mm-hmm. But uh, so anyway, that guy leaves and he, that guy's done. He he leaves um, and he kind of gets his detail and he starts like spending the night out at these weather shacks, right? Yeah, because well, because that guy that was supposed to be showing him, once he found out he wanted to go out to those far ones, mm-hmm. he told him he was on his own. Right. He's like, I'm not doing this no more. And he left the base apparently. Right. Because he was just like, I'm not, I'm not doing this shit no more. You know, I'm not going out there. And he's clearly freaked out for some reason. So while he's out there, um, it's it's so it starts pretty soon. He never really gives like a day, like how many days he was out there, but yeah. like, uh, like it, he said in the first six months is the first kind of like timeline he gives, right. And it started like, out as just like kind of like ominous feelings, seeing things out of the corner of his eye. And one, right. of, the, one of the things that I found interesting was that he was talking about the sounds that he would hear sounded like uh, a, Western, a Western me- Meadowlark. Right, the Which, bird. if you've heard a Western Meadowlark, there's, there's a few other birds that do it too. They kind of have this metallic pang kind of robotic song that they do. It's it's hard to describe until you listen to it. If you go and listen to a Western Meadowlark, they have this very, it's, it's very rhythmic pa- pang, and, and it does kind of sound like electronic-y kind of uh, call. It's hard to explain. It's like huh. a warbling metal sound that they have to their call. Yeah, that- hear that warbling kind of... See, and it, it's a little robotic Wah. and points, and it does a little bit of a the like twisted metal. Yeah, yeah, he gets a little R two D two in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so he, so yeah, so he starts having sightings. Is probably the best way. Like he, right? He, so it's okay. It's important to note that he kind of thinks he's going crazy yeah so he's but he's smart enough to know that like I'm by myself in the desert in the desert I'm sleepy cause he's has he has a lot of these a lot of these like sightings when he's like going to the bathroom mm-hmm. <laughs> Which apparently the tall whites like to watch you pee yeah <laughs> yeah they really like that sphincter buddy <laughs> but like it out for their their but he actually tools. says that like he he like goes to the latrine and he like knows somebody's there but he's like oh, i'm just half asleep you know yeah at one point there's a woman watching him right he gets up and he walks by and he's 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 so afraid that he, he thinks that he's possibly still dreaming and he thinks the best thing to do is ignore it. And he just walks by this woman standing in his bunk and goes to the bathroom. So and goes back to be... sleep. He went, he's like, the best thing I could do is go back to sleep. I'm like, I don't know if that was the best thing you could do. I kind of think I would do that. That's <laughs> ah, weird, I, man. I kind of feel like I've done that before. <laughs> like I've definitely heard stuff in my house. And I'm yeah. like, ah. Uh, yeah, not so much now. But we we lived out in, uh, out in the sticks, right? Um, yeah, I would hear stuff in the house all the time. I don't know if I'd do it if there was like a spooky glowing white chick in the corner staring at me. No, and trying to hide. 
No, but there's definitely been times where I've definitely heard something in my mm-hmm. house. And I'm like, you know what? Let him bring the fight to it'll, me. It'll, if we're it'll gonna... work itself out. It'll work right? itself. I'm real tired right now. Got to go to three dogs before it gets to me. I'm cool. <laughs> I didn't have a dog. Three cats who don't give a shit. Right? Right. <laughs> right. Mine watch mice go by. <laughs> I did. That used to happen with us out because we lived out in the country, and we would have mice, and they'd just be sitting by the fire. I'm like, you are not paying your rent. Right. Like, what the hell are you doing? Right. I had to throw them at it. Yeah, get that thing. Jesus. You're doing more work than they are. I got to wound it first. Here's how you do it. <laughs> now, the one goes outside and he does whatever, but. So, know. yeah. So, he starts having these. He starts having these sightings. And mm-hmm. then he has, like, a firsthand sighting. Yeah. He's, like, out there and he says he sees what he says. He's real careful, but he says a white little girl. Right, mm-hmm. and uh, so he's like, he goes back and he gets his canteen because it's the desert, yeah. Right, so it's a it's a hundred degrees or whatever, and he's like, hey, little girl. So he's kind of like going after her because he he does see her, mm-hmm. and um, he's like, hey, you know, do you need some water? And he's kind of getting closer to her and closer to her, but he's got to break down the thicket. She's kind of like in this. Uh, sage, low, he get yeah. sage brush. He's got he this low it. sage that that she's tr- like kind of like in the center of, and it's real thick stuff. It's all stiff and and jagged and sharp, and and it cuts you up real good. It's it, you do have to like break it down. It's all it's not like a bush that gives. So he does see her, mm-hmm. and he finally gets to her, and when he turns her around, he's like. She's not a little girl. Like she is. She's what he says is she looks just like us, except she's completely different. Like they have smaller lips, smaller ears. She's white as like a piece of paper, is like mm-hmm. how he describes it. And he's so freaked out that he just kind of turns around and starts like staggering back to his barracks and he keeps saying I'm the weatherman you know if you need any help or you need any water I have it just come I'll give it to you and I'll call the range commander he kind of keeps repeating that mm-hmm. which again is something I would do <laughs> <laughs> that is totally something I would do I'm just gonna go over I, and get you some water alright yeah I would not freak here. out I would not freak out I would try to be cool um, but I would definitely like try to walk away very calmly. Um, and then there's like a point where this kind of happens again, but he comes in contact with someone that he calls the teacher. Yes. And she is younger than... She's not a child, but she's not one of these older whites that he has seen. Mm -hmm. He said she's like a 20-something white, like a club chick, right? (laughs) (laughs) But but she's like, she's a younger version of the whites, right? And Mm -hmm. so there's at one point, this little girl's lost again. And he's like, they're looking in the wrong place for her, but he knows where she is and I, I didn't really quite understand this story, but like somehow he comes in contact with the teacher, this tall white, and it's her daughter. It's, it's her daughter. He's yeah, he says niece, niece, niece. Well, he that was the I think that was the first encounter with a child, but he okay. does save her daughter, and then that's when she kind of takes him in and it ends up being the teacher's pet. But but the, there's like. There's an encounter with Range for Harry. That was with the first girl. When he was leaving her, he saw what he called Range for Harry, which was right, the because, joke about the horse, but it became right. this actual man Guy. that was a tall white. Right. And he was actually running at him when he was heading away from that girl. And he was exactly. doing the calm thing. And he got to the door before that guy ever got to him. 
and he closed the door and then he never But then saw there's it. a point where him and Range for Harry look at each other and there's this older white and he's like he actually says this in the this is the documentary by the way you can watch it mm-hmm. it's on if you have Roku or Fire Stick it's free watch it um Range for Harry is kind of like watching what he's doing like yeah. what are you what are you gonna do and he's like trying to help and then there's this other tall white lady mm-hmm and he's like, he said it was the first time he ever communicated with him, but he kind of communicates with Range for Harry, the mm-hmm. the big, tall, white man. So he's like, he said, if I could say like what we said non-verbally, I, Range for Harry said something like, what does she want? And I looked at him and said, I don't know. And he looked at me and kind of was like, I don't know either. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> it's really yeah, so, funny. So, it's it's funny. He's got like he. I think he was referring to like when he what did like end up saving the daughter. Then she came to collect the daughter, and he range for Harry was apparently in the scrub and like making sure that he made cool. sure he was known. He stood up and made sure. But it's that got he could it's, it's just funny that on a yeah. universal level. That men are like men are like chicks, right? Right, bitches. (laughs) (laughs) What do you do? What do you do? (laughs) Can't live with them. Can't live without them. (laughs) Uh, That that was pretty funny. But uh, so he kind of like does his time in the desert. He then like goes to Vietnam, and this is all part of like the documentary when he goes to Vietnam. He's supposed to go to one place. Um, and when he gets there, they're like, no, you're going to another place, which was like, there was a lot more fighting going on. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, Ugh. so he like does his tour. He gets survived out. 35 attacks. He got a right. reward for that. Right. Yeah. He's totally decorated bronze star. Like mm-hmm. he's, yeah, he did his time in Vietnam. I'm not saying that at all. But then, like, he comes home, and he kind of, he meets his wife at a dance, and it's kind of like this, you know, <laughs> hopeless romantic type of meeting. Yeah. You should watch the documentary to see what she describes the their first meeting. Right, because he pretty, tells her he's going to marry her. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Which I love. But, like, yeah. uh, anyway, they do get together, and they're, like, you know, Getting newlyweds or whatever, starting off. Well, when he, uh, from what I heard, that she wouldn't actually marry him, and the one condition she had was that he graduate college. Right. So in record time, <laughs> right, right. He, he earned both a bachelor's in thermal physics and a master's in applied nuclear physics at San Diego State. Unbelievable. And then he did some PhD level postgraduate work at the University of Maine in Bangor. And then he later earned a master's in business administration from uh, Nova Southwestern University. But I didn't understand why. Okay, so I knew all that. But like, why was she like, hey, what are you writing? And let's try to publish it. That happened like 18 years later. He'd okay, been, so he, he'd been writing it for a while. So he didn't have a job at that point with all those degrees? No, he was a nuclear physicist. Still is. Okay, but I, I thought that she was like, well, you know, we it's time to publish it. Yeah, well, it, it, he was writing it in secret. He told her about the alien experience about, I don't know, about three months into their marriage, I think he said something like that. Right. But then... He was secretly writing a memoir for his children and grandchildren about his experiences. And she walked in one day and he like shut the laptop real quick. And she was like, what are you doing? And he finally broke down and showed her. And he was like, and she read it and said immediately, well, you have to get this published. So he's like, yeah, but you know, the government, I'm supposed to like not talk about it. Yeah, he changed all the names and. Right, and she's like, okay, why, why, you know, what are they going to say? 
And he's like, yeah, it's kind of a good point. Like, were they going to take me to court? Mm-hmm. And, that, and so he publishes it. And then he kind of goes on the circuit. And that's kind of where he's at now. Right now he's been yeah. talking to people, telling his story. He's pretty consistent. Yep, and he's got a he's very engaging and he's got a lot of uh he's, he's like of answers, man. He's, got a he's lot like of your dad's brother. He's like hot yeah. stories. Uh yeah. they're and they're really interesting, but he's a little long winded. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like it's very captivating as far as the story goes. Mm-hmm. Um and the story is is that when he went in the military, he gets set up in the middle of the desert. He's in the middle of the desert as a weatherman. And when he says weatherman, there's yeah. aliens out there. They've lived there for thousands of years. Yep. Uh, they're much old. They live for much longer than we do. Mm-hmm. And he, over time, kind of gains their trust, ends up sort of communicating with them uh, very lightly, but does have some kind of back and forth. They have some kind of mind erasing device that keeps you from remembering. Mm-hmm. You get into the, that. the military has sort of the same thing on the debriefing. They kind of do something similar to get you to kind of forget about your time. And mm-hmm. then he's hit with like war. He goes to Vietnam, and um, where he actually yeah. got non combat injured. He He's got a story about falling and hitting on a piece of concrete, cutting his knee open. And the medic wouldn't give him any Novocaine because he said he only had he two only had shots two. left. Right. Yeah. And he was saving it for... There was um, Somebody with a Viet- real... Yeah, there was Vietnamese civilians coming in. That is funny. He said he, he did say he was saving it for somebody that was really injured. <laughs> yeah. But he had apparently he had this like... Big gash on the enemy. Yeah, it's a bunch of stitches. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he does that, and then he he gets married. He has um, his whole life, family, and then he kind of gets caught writing this memoir about his time at Nellis. Mm-hmm. And when he when he gets caught by his wife writing this memoir, she reads it. She reads it. She's like, "We're publishing this," and he's like, "I don't know if we should." She says, screw it, let's do it. They do it, and that's kind of where he's at. He's like, now he's kind of famous, and he has this really crazy story mm-hmm. about like how his whole life kind of happened. And it is it is interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. And, um, yeah, let's, start, let's sort of get into some facts. Okay. All right, so where where'd you go on vacation? We were uh, just south of Flagstaff. Did oh, I was hoping to, I came. I, I didn't want to even hope you said. I thought you were gonna go to like Scottsdale or something. No, we because, were in between Sedona and Flagstaff. So the first time I drove to California, I left in January, and there was no snow in the Midwest. And then I got through Texas and I was going to try to make it to Vegas. And I was like getting tired and I kind of looked, this is before GPS, whatever. Looked at my map and like the next major town was like Flagstaff. Yeah. So I'm like, all right. In my car, I had a old Porsche 924 and S, it, it, it was rear wheel drive. Right. So uh, I bought it for like 2000 bucks. Stick was pimp. I loved it. It was a great car. But anyway, so I'm driving and I'm like going in, like I start going into the mountains, right? Yeah. And uh, it starts snowing and I'm in Arizona. Yeah. Yep. It's like snowing. It did our I'm first like, day there. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm like, 
so at first it's like flurries. I'm like, okay, whatever. And I, I believe it or not, it actually been in um, the desert before when it snowed. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like crazy. And I'm used to like the snow, but then it's snowing like a whiteout, right? So mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my god. So I like I drive. I see this exit. I get off, and there's like a. It wasn't the Motel Six, but it was like mid-range hotel, right? I, and I don't know. I, it's yeah. either a red carpet or red roof or Motel Six or something like that, right? So I, I get off. It's pitch black, and uh, I go get a room, and I had all my shit in my car, right? So this is like this is like the end of the '90s. And the car wasn't that big to begin with, right? Yeah. So, like, so, like, literally, I had, like, I had, like, the driver's seat was all I had. And all my stuff was, I laid the seat back, and all my clothes were on my, on my passenger seat, and all my stuff was in, like, the hatchback, right? Right. So, I had to, like, unload all that stuff, and I take it in, and uh, the hotel had a bar, so I went to the bar and they're like, last call. And I'm like, dude, it's fucking 10 o'clock. So I'm like, is there anywhere else to go? And they're like, they're like, yeah, there's a couple bars down down the way or whatever. So I'm like, all right. So like I have a drink there. I get this other bar and I walk in. And it's I, I it must have been early in the week because there wasn't anybody there. So like had a drink there, nobody, no, nothing nothing like uh, no story or anything so have a drink there there's like uh, I had like uh, a, there's a gas station that had like some late night like uh, microwave food <laughs> I got some microwave food fucking go back I, I got two to go beers from the bar and I'm drinking beer in my hotel room eating my whatever mm-hmm. hungry man and uh I get to sleep. So I'm on, not really on a timetable on this one, but I was trying to get there because I really didn't have a ton of money. You know, so I couldn't like take my time. But uh, so I wake up in the morning and I'm like, what the fuck? There's these huge redwood trees. <laughs> and yeah. snow everywhere. And I'm Under like, this line. is the coolest place I've ever been in my entire life. But I didn't see it because I came in at night. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. It's with us too. We we were uh, we we landed in Phoenix, and by the time we were getting close to to, to our place, because it, it was like a two hour, it's like a two hour sure. drive from Phoenix, yeah. and uh, it started getting dark. So like when we started really getting into it, you couldn't see anything that was going on, and we woke up in the morning. We were driving back out. You know, like the next day to go get stuff and it was like holy shit this everywhere you look it was like this scenic and it was all different it's like everywhere it could look like it's flat and there's nothing there and you round a corner and it drops way down into the skelly and it's all red rocks and you know what i mean <laughs> or mountains or it's pretty crazy there it was so really, what people don't realize is Flagstaff is really high up. It's like one right. of the highest cities. Sure. And it's actually way higher than Denver. I believe that. I, I didn't know that, but I believe that. Yeah. I, Denver's like I a said, mile high, but Flagstaff is is pushing 7,000. It's like 6,900 feet in the air. So I kept, like I said, I kept going up and up and up into the mountains, and it kept snowing more and more and more. Mm-hmm. And then when I got up there, I didn't realize what kind of town it was. Like, you know, mm-hmm. the geography of it. Like, where, where's the other bar? You know, I just thought, <laughs> that, they're like, dude, I don't know. You know? Like, <laughs> and, um, but what a cool area mm-hmm. Flagstaff is. Yep. Even on the other side, Sedona is really cool. That's when you get like where it's like Red Rock. and Sure. That's so really I, cool. So, back to what we're talking about. Another time I drive out there, again, I'm trying to hit Las Vegas on the first day, and I'm, I'm I come across, I come over this path, and, and I had I'd stopped too long one time. I stopped about an hour too long 
and I was getting tired and I come over this pass and this is again before GPS and that everybody had it on their phone right mm-hmm. so I had done this drive though and I kind of remembered certain parts so I'm like I think I'm gonna come over like I remember wherever I was I'm like I think I'm gonna come up over here there's like a little town but I had come into it earlier the last time and then when I came in it's like late right so the whole town shut down it's like, I don't know, it's 11 o'clock or whatever. Get, drive through the town, nothing's open. I'm like, shit. And I have enough gas, but I'm like, I, I had to pee. I needed, some, I needed like a Mountain Dew. You know, you know, right. you know, you know how it is. So I'm like, fuck it. So I, I go to like, kind of out, you drive out of town. And then when I'm driving out of town, you come like over this, down this little mountain. And there's a gas station right there. I pull over and there's lights on in the gas station Um, you can get gas right so I'm like all right so I get gas and I go up and I get to open the door door's locked the guy's in there I'm like "Ah." I'm like I gotta pee I'm like (laughs) he's like he just looks at me shakes his head and he points I'm like I can pee there and he's like he shakes his head yeah I'm like you're not gonna call the cops He's like, no. <laughs> all right, all right. So I go over and I'm peeing, and I hear like fucking footsteps while I'm peeing, and I'm like, God damn it, you know what I mean? And I had a cell phone, but it was in the car because this is before you just kept your cell phone on you all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, fuck, stand there, and I had a Zippo lighter, and I pulled out my Zippo, and I was like, click, and I flicked it, and did. There was a fucking cow, like, <laughs> like three feet from me. It scared the shit out of me. I'm like, oh my god! Right? <laughs> but that's how dark the desert is. It's mm-hmm. so dark when they say you can't see your hand out in front of you. It's like that dark. Your eyes don't adjust, and like there were parts. There were parts that I don't know if you went through this when you were driving but like your interior lights like your speedometer lights and shit like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Will, will blind you yep because <clears throat> it's so fucking dark you can't yeah. see it. you have to turn your interior lights down because you can't see when you drive because you're getting blinded by your speedometer lights which have zero lumens whatsoever right you know we, had I mean? a, we had a rented car and it had a GPS was like up high in the center of the dash. And so it was really fucking bright. You couldn't see anything. It was like driving me nuts. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It gets real. It's, it's really weird. But there's, uh, that's the desert is like they got high desert and then they got the, you know, sure. Sure. So they got the dry desert, you got a high desert. And they, they like, it's like where you say where we come from. If you don't like the weather, just stick around. It'll change. <laughs> yeah. For them, it's like, if you don't like the weather, just drive about an hour that way. Right. Yeah. You know, Definitely. or drive about two hours that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, and you can completely change your, your weather. You get up into the Ponderosa Pines and it's all by Flagstaff and it's all Ponderosa Pine and it gets cold and it's snowy and it, when we got there, there was snow in the front yard of the place we were staying at. That's right. It's crazy, isn't it? Right. And, w- and when we were sitting at the Phoenix airport, it was probably like 82 degrees. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah it's, you- it's really, desert's really weird. But So, like, I used to... So, L.A. is a, it's a big city. You live on top of a bunch of people. Even though it's a little bit more sprawled out than, like, New York City. There's still so many people. There's so much traffic, right? Mm-hmm. And so what I used to do is I used to, like, book up off days. Like, and mm-hmm. I would take, like, two months. And I'd be like, I'd have a target day. I'd be like, hey, I have to do something on this day. Because I always had a bunch of jobs, you know. I, I would have, like, three jobs. So I was like, I would bartend. I'd have, like, a sales job. And then. I'd have like an entertainment job, right? And I always do like all those jobs. And then I'd kind of work 
all the days where I'd have like a week off mm-hmm. and I would go into the desert by myself all the time. I fucking love the desert. There's something like before we moved here, um, I want I, th- I think I told you I wanted to move to LA. She's like, I don't know about LA. And I said, what about Palm Springs? And Palm Springs is just one of those places. Like the, the mountains mm-hmm. are in your face. And it, it's hot, but at night it's cool. And like no bugs, no humidity. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's got this cool vibe to it, you know? And um, yeah, man, there's different stuff you can get into. There's all kinds of like geographical things or there's all kinds of like sizes. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like there's hot springs. There's like, like you said, you go and there's snow and there's like right. there's all kinds of things you can see. Like I've seen a flash flood. That's fucking bizarre. Right. Like I, I remember I was in I was in Vegas and we were driving in and we see all these people standing on the overpass and they're looking and we like stop. We're like, what are you guys looking at? And they're like, there's a flash flood coming. And we're like, how do you know? And they're like, well they told us. Of, and so like we stopped, we're waiting, we're like, where is it? And we're like waiting, waiting. This guy's like, there it is. And dude, there was like all when they say like a wall of water. Yeah. And the, it's it's very deceiving. Cause it's not like you can't jump out of the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's also like if you don't do something, it'll take you over. Yeah. So it's like twenty five miles an hour, I would say. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And it's got sticks and shit. Yeah, in the front. And and yeah. Right. And it's it's that but literally it's like six feet high. And that's what's kind of holding everything back. Mm-hmm. And then once that breaks, dude, it's just a turret. Like it's it's crazy. It's like you know, it's like all this power like just runs through these yeah. spillways that they have. And uh yeah, what a trip. Like the desert's uh, the desert's awesome. Right. So did you, is that your first trip to the desert? Yeah, that was first time. That was the first it's, time going that far west for me. It's magical, though, right? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> it's it, it was something else. It was, and not only that, and we went the, to the, the Grand skies? Canyon, and like, oh. uh, and it's like a two-hour drive to the Grand Canyon. And the whole time right. I'm going, man, are we driving two hours to look at a hole in the ground? And like, is, is this thing really going to awe me? And then like, when you get there, it's just like, it, it takes your breath away and hits you in the pit of your stomach. You're like, you don't even know what to do. It's like, it's incredible, right? It's too much to take in. It it's is. almost like it's too much to take in. You can't see it all. It's, it's, it like messes with you, your vision, you know, perspective is all off. It's like, like you can't if you ever see watch, the bottom. Like, you watch like discovery channels and they're like, uh, this professor in Arizona has spent the last 30 years studying the Grand Canyon. You're like, how boring. But it's not, right? Because right. <laughs> like, yeah. dude, literally every day, you're like looking at something different, trying to figure out how it became that. Well, even know? the people I talked to about going there, they're like, oh, did you see this and this? And I'm like, no, I don't think we were in the same part. You know what I mean? Right. Because there's all these different like places you can go there and be in the edge of the Grand Canyon and different parks and and not be at the same place. It's but, really like it's really intense. Like the the desert to me is very spiritual. There's certain yeah. things like the ocean. I believe being by the ocean makes you feel a certain way. Mm-hmm. It's 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 just I don't know what's in the water or salt water or salt air or whatever there's like positives that like get into your body and make you feel better right but i believe that about the desert i believe that about mountains i believe that about lakes all that stuff like like the the like any kind of forest right I agree. Has, has that kind of like uh it has that kind of like um environment connection yeah where, where a city doesn't yeah absolutely like I there okay New York City when you're in New York you're like I'm part of New York right LA there's times you're like I'm part of LA 
<laughs> Chicago is kind of like that. You're like, I'm kind of part of Chicago. But, like, honestly, you don't get the same thing as being on a beach or being in the mountains or being in the forest or being yeah. in the desert. There's just something about it that just doesn't translate to a city. And I think that's why people live out there, man. They just, they love being out there. It's like peace. It's like, you know, the other thing, you can see anything coming, you know? Like, right. I would say, I would say like, and I don't know if you saw this, but like, if you drive out there by, by flight, there's like towns where like the main road, you're driving on it and you can look over and see the entire town. Right. And you're like, well, like if there's a party. Oh, yeah. Almost <laughs> every one of them you can do that. And you can right. see the whole entire place. Where you're and you're like, well, there. that's where it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And there's there's something like, I don't know, man. There's something really magical about that. And like Stephanie's always like, because I watch uh, abandoned places on like YouTube. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, why do you always watch like, Mysteries stuff out of the abandoned in the desert? I'm like, because it blows my mind. So like the Bureau of Land Management, they like, you know, they they take over these places that are settled by people or they take them over forcefully. And this goes back to our Area 51, the family that had the ranch. <laughs> and like, right. and like, you know, maybe this guy uh, that encountered all this stuff it's because this valley and he said it's right off the Nellis Air Force Base out in the middle of nowhere because there's nothing there right yeah he's he yeah because he wasn't actually at Nellis he was at the Indian Springs right uh, and he uh, said it's a, Ridge, it's, he says is... a, it's a really long valley mm -hmm. and that's true so now what what was interesting is that since he's published his books and told his stories, when he was writing his books, uh, there wasn't the advanced um, mapping that we have now today, like where you can look at Google Earth. Right. So he's telling these stories and he's given precise, because he's a math guy, He's and because he's taking weather readings that are accurate to directions he's looking and distances and all that stuff, He's accurately like depicting where he's at and what he's looking at. And now with GPS, people have gone back and checked him on that and found it at least for his directional sense was correct. And his distancing was correct. Like if he said I was here and I saw them over there, they can line that up and say, yeah, and what was possible. the name? Of, what was the name of the place where he was Indian Springs? Yeah, it was the Indian Springs uh, gunnery range. So, I mean, we we looked up on the Area 51, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of these places, and there there were we could get like satellite images that were generic, right? Mm -hmm. but, they, but they did show like they did show like um, you know different structures and stuff on the base that corresponded with what Bob Lazar said. Mm -hmm. Now I right. didn't, I didn't look up uh, his, but now that you said that, that did. Cause Bob Lazar told his story when, when there, there was at least the tentative beginnings of the, all the mapping that has been done in recent years. So he could be fact checked pretty quick on his stuff. And, and he did get checked on a lot of that stuff, but a lot of his stuff, his locations were secretive, but for Charles Hall, he, what he's saying is this was an active weather reporting stations that were known and they weren't, they weren't exactly top secret or anything like that. So right. they could look at him and say, yeah, if he was looking in this direction from, I think it's called a theropod or whatever that he uses to, to locate. He, the he, theodolite, the theodolite, there you go. <laughs> something like that. Right. So he, uh, he got checked on, on that and 
He's done several interviews. And what I I thought this was this was uh, interesting. He did an interview with Michael Sala, who is the um, he's the founder of galacticdiplomacy.com and okay. exopolitics <laughs> right okay. so he did he did a uh, an interview with him and he was asking him really i thought really interesting questions because he was talking about that, that what people don't understand but we haven't given them this information yet is that uh charles hall's experience over two years and didn't involve just a couple of rough sightings after a while they were just around right and generals and other army people saw them too and they they the generals communicated with them all the time they gave them stuff and it and he started finding out all these things and he found out that they were actually trying to give the u.s government some exoplanets and another solar system but they would it was the it was the up, agreement was like they would because the United States is like totally a base right but there. They, but the United States wanted to know how to get there, mm-hmm. technology wise. Right, and, they and they're like them... no, they're like no 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 because mm-hmm. they were we'll, really we'll, careful. We'll, he told them they gave them they would we'll trade information here and there with them, right. but they wouldn't give them interstellar capabilities. They, they said they we'll take them. you there like a bus. They did give them nuclear propulsion technology apparently. But did not, but what would not achieve light speed? And but these, they did, their ships came and went all the time. He interacted with them all the time. And what's interesting is what he said about them is that they were they were always conscious of their children. They were very scared about people being around their kids. They were really overly protected of, of them, and because they came from. Uh, where they came from, it, they their bodies were skinnier, taller, weaker, and you could like easily if it was a one on one fist fight, you could take them. And but the problem was is that they were always heavily armed. He said at all times they were heavily armed, and he said well, they, they they actually said one time um, he was saying, "Why are you? If you could just take me out, why are you worried?" He's, and they sort of communicated to him well you're from here and we're not like a bumblebee sting would like kill us instantly yeah. right so they, they were and that makes cautious. sense yeah it makes sense but they he said they had this uh, holier than thou attitude a little bit like where they would go around he, and yeah because would... he asked them how should I how should I like what would he kind of communicated to them I shouldn't say asked them but he said, uh, how would you like me to, you know, address you if if, mm-hmm. if we come and got it? And they said, you should be honored yeah. to, like, communicate with us. Right. And they they, 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 they like the joke about him being the pet, too. Because mm-hmm. that's how they treated the humans. And they said they had a lot of disdain for any humans, that the other soldiers that didn't understand what they were saying. They would just blow them off. Except for Wayne Newton, because apparently they like to roll into Vegas and get his shows. <laughs> yeah, apparently they every now and then he he said he saw one outside of the base in uh, in a casino and restaurant or something like that. He's like, I could tell it was one of them dressed as a as a human. Right? Now another odd thing I thought found is that he they were really because when they, they were making jokes about the pet thing they were like you're the only civilization that gives a crap about the animals on their planet right i did hear that yeah I did hear they said that. that all the other aliens and and now this is the this is the other part that it goes deeper than this that charles hall actually has somehow attained intelligence on not just these tall whites who he spent so much time but with, but he knows Roswell. about it, it's several other. Right, uh, he said he's seen three. Right, yeah, the Roswell aliens. Mm-hmm. He called them the Norwegians, but they're really the Nordics. Is that yeah, what the Nordics? Yeah, and they have twenty-four teeth. Twenty-four teeth. I don't know why that's important at I, all. I have no idea how many teeth do we have. I don't know. I don't even know. I don't even know why I count that. I mean, if you had like, if it was like a species that had like two. 
right. or 500. <laughs> then I'd be paying attention. You know right. what I mean? Is that more than us? It's, I think 24 <laughs> is close, isn't it? Like, it seems like it's a close number. If you're from Hazard, that's like a solid number. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck 24 teeth had. Anyway, he's he's seen all, all this stuff. He, he was even on their ship. And we, this one cracked me up is that they were using, like, store off-the-shelf parts for right. the spaceship. So I it got the impression that it was this, like, we're... We're kind of on our own when we're out this far. So we're making do with your shit. But here's the thing. This interview with, to get back to this interview, this interview that um, Sala did with him, he asked him about like what they were doing on the day to day. And he was talking to him about the structure that they wanted him to build for them and blah, blah, blah. And that they were trying to give them this property. But he was saying they were doing they were doing interstellar trips and they, they would come in and land and they were loading the ships with supplies given to them by the U.S. government. And he asked him what those supplies were and he said, I feel certain that children's clothes, adults' clothes, and food stuff were big items. I also feel certain that pure refined meals such as uh, metal, sorry, such as aluminum and titanium were also included in the trade. Right. I and so this is weird because they were doing a lot. He was saying over time, they were doing a lot of taking children's and adult clothes that were our clothes with them. But he spent a lot of time talking about the suits they wore, how advanced they were. And they even allowed them to hover. Dude, and you get on a spaceship. Why the fuck go- do you need on our clothes for Right? You get on a spaceship, you go like all the way across the universe, and then you get off the spaceship and you're at the new planet, and it has 2022 Super Bowl champion Cincinnati Bengals. Sports. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like the shirts they get away in Africa. Who <laughs> 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 day? Who <laughs> day? <laughs> <laughs> Two day champions, bitches. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, but yeah, but you're you, right. I, it's weird, right? Okay, so in my mind, immediately, and I don't know why anybody he didn't mention this, but in my, they're talking about building a having the giving of exoplanet to the government, right? To colonize, right? And right. now you have. And they tell them they can't give them the propulsion system, right? Right. But they're transporting clothes and food that they wouldn't need. Like, it doesn't make sense that they would be taking hundreds and hundreds of clothing for children and adults when they're not going to wear those clothes. They're tall. They're, they're six to seven foot tall. You know, they're, they're, so yeah so is it giving you the eerie feeling that the colonization happened that somewhere out there there's a planet with humans on it yeah don't know earth exists yeah and they're being given clothes and and food well i mean i think the overall thing is is that what happened here? Right, like that's I'm, that's on my brain. Like, what, because is that what Joe, he's you know, Joe Joe Rogan jokingly said like years ago to stand up, but uh, I think the Egyptians rolled up on the pyramids and they're like, "Yeah, we built this. Yeah, we built that." <laughs> and you know that like always mm-hmm. threw me for a loop because yeah. they've been trying to fit it into their history, but like at the same time. They think they're a lot older. Like, they think the Great Pyramid could be 10,000 years older than it actually is. And the same for the Sphinx. They actually think the Sphinx, the reason the head is so much smaller than the body, because it used to be another head. Mm-hmm. Right. No, no, no lie. That's no yeah, yeah, no, I've heard that. Yeah. So, like, you know. It makes we, sense, too, because that head does not fit. Also, like with the sand patterns and the drift and all that, 
like it was almost to like the upper chest of the uh-huh. sphinx or before they excavated it because when they actually found they thought it was a head which is crazy <laughs> right? right and then they actually excavated it like in the late 1800s and and then it had this giant body so it's been excavated yeah. So the, just the sand shift alone, they thought was like a thousand years or two thousand years. You know, they can't really. It all depends on what happened and whatever. But like, yeah, that's always like Hell, stuck. it might have been buried when the new head was put on it. Right, right. They didn't realize it was uh, the whole the there. whole like Napoleon thing where he shot the nose off. Not true. Yeah, yeah. Like none of that's true. Like, and, and then. You know, they have, like, the base of the body is, like, you know, it dates way older than the rest of it. It's weird, right? Egypt's weird like that. And maybe, I mean, just maybe, like, maybe all that shit was here already. (laughs) You know? Yeah. And that's crazy. Because maybe we were just put here. You know? Why not? And, you know, know, this, this, that whole thing about sending people to another planet... Wow, yeah. Why is that crazy? Because it could, because it's totally, if this, if his story's true, to, totally be what's going on. Right. Now, there, there's a, he's got, there's so much to this, it's hard to get to all of it, but there's, there's so many quotes he's got from like, he's quoted like situations that he's been in with these people where the people are talking and he overhears things. And there's, there's a lot of threats of death by these aliens. They threaten death like all right. the time. Right. They get scared and spooked real easy. And they're always like, we will kill you. And there was even a guy that he thought he was being followed by a dog and he threw a rock and he hit one of their kids and broke its arm with the rock. And they, 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 the woman that found him said, I was told I have to give you a warning before I kill you. This is your warning. Shit. Don't come back out here alone again or I'll kill you. And this is a different serviceman. He said that there was like one of the cooks was like accidentally startled one of them one day and they, they almost killed him. And so when when Charles Hall was walking in there, he said, they're back there, Charlie. Don't go back there. You'll scare them like I did. They'll kill you if you scare them. They told huh. me so. So like he's there it's like this constant like threat of death and the way they talk about how they like just wiped out animals if they competed with them. Like if there right. was because they were like they ate they were eat their uh, meal uh, their diet was veg like vegetarian and all the animals that had you know competed with them in that food group, they would just kill them all off. It's like really odd, like for sophisticated behavior you would think but yeah, if you're but so like advanced that you're that. like but see if you think about it like this though if you have the capability to, to travel interstellar you're you're like you're not we, save you, the animals you have you have no idea what you're talking about man there is so much shit out there you know right your whole planet doesn't matter we can wipe you out there's 50 like, billion more if there's koalas right <laughs> burn them all who cares because there's 50 million more on this other planet 50 million right planets. there's a koala planet you know that <laughs> <laughs> right like <laughs> so like it's 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 weird to me they and they like talk i mean like he caught a lot of conversations he's got a lot of like different little stories of interactions with them even when they're talking to the generals and talking down about them while they're like right next to them, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's weird. But now here's one of the things too. He, he had said once around the teacher and some of the, um, some of the young kids, he had mentioned the star Arcturus. Yeah, and, they, they, it's right. And there was like, and there was like a hush in the crowd. And like the older lady asked with some surprise, teacher, does Charlie know where we come from? And she said, no, but he's close. So he started doing the mathematician that he is. He started like coming up with like a star chart 
of the closest possibilities from where they would actually come from. You know what I mean? And he has a list of the nearest stars and the, from what he could figure. He, he said would, one had like a, it had like two letters and a number name. BD 36.2147. It's 8.2 um, light years away. And he said, he says that's the one he thinks, but he doesn't know for, he can't say with any definitive. So you want to look at something funny real quick? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm looking at Indian Springs uh, base off of Area 51. And if you zoom in, there's a Subway restaurant. (laughs) 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 That's really funny. Jim Gaffigan has this thing where he's like, Subways are everywhere. He's like, I got a Subway in my dressing room. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, so like, so right, he was kind of close to saying where they're from, but they never really told him where they're yeah, from. Yeah, they wouldn't give him that information. And, and no matter how trustworthy they thought they, he could be, they were still always cautious. He overheard several of them talking, like one of them was telling his children, like, okay, you can be part of the teacher's pet project, but don't get too close to him. And if he does anything funny, kill him. <laughs> like <laughs> that's that's like their answer for everything. <laughs> Just fucking kill him. You know what I mean? And up and like now, my wife. She's the books that uh, Charles all for for those out there if they want to read it. It's called Millennial Millennial Hospitality, and he wrote like there's like four parts to it. And my wife's actually read the books. Okay. And she, she's always saying that an advanced civilization wouldn't be like warring and they would have empathy and you know what I mean? It would be like they'd be beyond okay. that. And she doesn't believe in the that people should be telling other people to be afraid of an alien invasion because they would be obviously friendly if they could travel across space. Okay. So she kind of hates I don't, that I don't part about that. wiping out animals. And I don't like, believe that at all. Yeah. So that, that, that part because it's sit more well with her. With me, it seems like if I'm the dominant species and I see a reckless species, right? right so I see a group of hillbilly guys <laughs> that are going to ruin it for everybody. And I can just wave my hand. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? Right. But so, I guess I mean, that's me. Well, like I, like I, like I said, there's... if there's no teaching them, I would, I would probably give them a chance. Like, hey, listen, that isn't how we do it. And they're like, watch this, and they fucking throw an M80 at me, and I just wave my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, I do understand that way of thinking, kind of. Like, I'm killing them for there. Okay, come on. We're, they're yeah, they're, he, ruining, he, <laughs> they're yeah. ruining this place. Right. <laughs> Chuck's cool, but like, <laughs> all, all these other guys, so, come yeah. on, man. Right. So, that's right. It's like, I think if you had the, like, the ability to know how big the because the universe is so huge to know right. like to have information about all these other planets like you might have even watched planets just completely get destroyed sure like more than once you know and it was like ah yeah. oh, that's sad but it's 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 over now you know it's gone they're, yeah. they're, all, they're all dead so it's like oh one animal one person pff, kill them you know so they yeah. always so they all carried around this like square device and it could stun, it could kill, it could make you like, he knock described you out. Like, hypnotized sort of. Yeah. And you could be hypnotized because one time they tried to use it on him early on so that he wouldn't remember what was going on, but he was still half conscious. So right. he remembered parts of it. And he thinks it was because of his interaction with um, Range 4 Harry and gaining their trust a little bit that they didn't fully, you know, neuralize him. 
All so. right. Well, let's uh, let's get into what we think. All right. Okay, so why don't I go first? Because you were the last one in the desert, and I haven't been there mm-hmm. in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I believe it because I'll, I'll tell you why. Like, I definitely think there's weird parts that have been blocked off. They're like, it's the only way I can say it. Mm-hmm. And it's not just here, I think it happens all over the world. Because I think when you come across something like this, um, the most educated way to deal with this would be to let it happen and study it. Mm -hmm. And especially if you get your higher ranking people that you know aren't going to say anything because they have a golden parachute, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I would, I would totally keep them there, and it's, and it's, I've been out here. Um, the size of where they are, they always say Rhode Island. It's not really Rhode Island. It's more like Kentucky. It's so fucking big that like nobody's going there. Nobody's trying to go there because. It's godforsaken climate. Um, you know, you're not taken away from anybody. They've literally, when they acquired all these acres for Area 51 and all these square miles, nobody cared. Because they're like, mm-hmm. it, it got zero fight. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think if there's people from another planet that are sort of like us... And he explained they're all like flesh and blood. All the aliens, quote unquote. They would live there. What do you think that's like? uh, If it. Well, Stephanie. If it works for me, it'll work for the. Well, thing. Well, Stephanie said to me. Because it's working here. Stephanie said, um, why are they here? And I said, I think they've always been here. I think they've always been here. We're the aliens. Because I kind of think that's what it is. I kind of it makes sense that way. According to Charles Hall, they've only been here for about five thousand years. Okay. Okay. That's what he is. That's what he said. He could like kind of extrapolate from talking to them and, and hearing okay. their stories about being around at this time. And he was like, "Well, with their age and range and how many elders they have, and blah blah blah." And he started doing math on it. Okay. But that's there's nothing definitive there. He just was guessing, you know. But like underwater UFOs or UAPs mm-hmm. or whatever, um, that's like. Which, if you were gonna hide, that's the place to hide. That's been floated out there already. That they've already been. They've been here forever. They've been here before us. That was floated out by the Navy as a possible theory. Yeah, there was a, a guy named Corey Good who apparently worked in. Um, he's a whistleblower in yeah. an Air Force top secret stuff, and he said that part of the disclosure, the recent disclosure that we mm-hmm. covered, right. that that was uh, that the disclosure of Tall Whites was supposed to was was put up there to be possibly part of the disclosure, and they took it down. Okay, I am also reserving a place. That it's LSD. <laughs> because I'm going to say this is why. Um, that would, They were testing that big time then. Mm-hmm. Um, he was by himself. Right. So he's like an isolated subject. Mm-hmm. Um, either It's either one of two things. Either aliens have been here forever. 
and they've always either had a presence here and they're the reason we're here or we were here and then they came here. I kind of think it's the other way. They've always been here and then we became us and they developed us. And they can hide better from us because they've been it's home field advantage. Like you know, right? right. It's it's home alone. You know where all the it's all like the Vietnam. Yeah, you know where all the rooms are, right? You know right. what I mean? You know where all the paint buckets are full of paint, right? Okay, so or or and the way he describes it is the only reason I say this is because he describes it as He's constantly checking himself with his mind. He's constantly like, okay, maybe I didn't see this. Maybe this isn't real. Maybe I'm wrong. And I do this, like, you know, in my everyday job, um, I do this all the time. And the guy I work with was like, you're not wrong. And I'm like, well... I always reserve a place for if I am wrong and I look it up in my book and I'm like, nope, not wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Right. But like, but if, you know, I'm somebody like him, you know, and you're out there and like I said that I I was taking a pee and I'm like, what the fuck is walking up on me? Like, it's definitely not a person. (laughs) What is this? And then finally like, flick my, it's a cow, you know what I mean? Like, and that cow scared the shit out of me. And I'm from, you know, the Midwest, which I, you know, I've been in. I've been in like grease pig contest and like <laughs> then some cow know. tipping. Right, I'm around cows all the time. Cows don't scare me, but like that one scared the shit out of me. You know what I mean? So the fear of the unknown, and then I can also see these very human reaction that he had. To like, oh, I'm, I'm just a weatherman, and you know, walk away. Yeah. Sheepishly, because you can't win, because they've already fucked you up. They've already scared the shit out of you, right? Yeah. So like, I do understand that too. Like, I'm very rarely intimidated, but when I am, I I know like well enough to get the fuck out of there. You know, my my dad used to say like in his hand to hand combat training in Vietnam, he's like. Uh, the first the guy said, he comes out of you, you poke him in the eye, he keeps coming at you, you kick him in in the groin. If he keeps coming after you after that, you get the hell out of there because you got a tough guy. <laughs> right. So like I would know <laughs> by my physical limitations yeah. and I would do kind of what he did. I would uh, I, got, I got water if you need right. water. Yeah. yeah. I would do that. That'd I'd be over here. <laughs> that is something I would do. So I kind of believe him and I kind of believe maybe that all that stuff's suppressed and you know it is and he, he kind of said every day he was like well I didn't maybe I didn't see that you know he's like I was driving my car and then all of a sudden there's like a spaceship a parallel on the on the gravel road where I like I'm gonna have to try to back up and get out you know go back mm-hmm I have to make like a 13 point turn and get away from the spaceship. He's like, well, yeah, that was an odd story too. And he said that was like the Tic Tac. He's like, that's their spaceship. So he's like, all right, well, you know, at first you're like, oh, there's a spaceship, right? And then you do your turn you back and then you're so scared that you like drive away and you don't even want to look in your rear view, you know? And then you get like, you get away and you finally look in your rear view and nothing's there. And you're like, that didn't really happen, you know, but you're still driving away from it. Right. And then there's the other part of me that reserves a place that maybe he was some kind of experiment that they were like fucking with him, like on a chemical level, like maybe LSD or like an MK ultra thing, because our friend that was a teacher and you know uh, a kid gave him LSD in his coffee yeah man if you're not ready for that shit <laughs> right? right oh my god if you're not ready for that and you don't know that it's gonna be crazy and then all of a sudden you start experiencing things like that holy shit and then when you get into like you know people that take DMT 
which is not relatively new. Like people have known about DMT for a very long time. Mm-hmm. All right, like people th- see like other dimensional beings all the time. They just said like, I just read this thing on Reddit. It's like ninety four percent of people that take DMT they report some kind of like inner dimensional being that they see. Yeah, so I've heard that that they you feel like you're um, in another dimension, not that you're hallucinating. Right. So I, so it's one of the two. It's either that this is. There was no shenanigans by the government, and always shenanigans by the government. Uh, I, right, I kind of think so too. But either there was no shenanigans by the government, and there are these aliens that live out there, and they've lived there forever, or um, that he was, you know, made to f- see these things, and these are visions that he had due to like some kind of chemical compound that they threw at him because he was by himself. Either way, I believe what he saw. Whatever he mm-hmm. saw, right? I think he. I think he's. It's like what you said about Bob Lazar. You believe Bob Lazar saw what he saw, and yeah. you know that's a really good explanation for it. Because whether or not you think it's alien or not, that guy's just too believable, and he is too. He's. Mm-hmm. He's. He's. You know, I went back and looked at his older. Um, so I looked at it. I I paid less attention to the stories. I kind of watched the stories, and then I went back and watched his earlier stuff, where he's like maybe twenty years ago. Mm-hmm. He's actually more believable than Bob Lazar. And I thought Bob Lazar was a pretty good actor, or really good at conveying the story that he experienced. And he, yeah, well, Paul had a lot more time too. So he's got a lot more story. Mm-hmm. He did. I'll give you that. Still, you're talking, I mean, you're still talking 40 years, 50 years. You know, by the time he's telling this again. Yeah. And he's got a cane now and he can barely walk. And, you know, you got to think he's slipping. I mean, he's at the same age as Bruce Willis. And Bruce Willis can't even read a script right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, come on, man. You're going to say he's highly functional. And it's just not true. Like, no matter how smart you are, at some point, you start to slip. And he just hasn't slipped, man. It's just the same story over and over. So I kind of feel like everything that he experienced, he experienced, whether or not it was drug-induced, I don't know, but... I kind of feel like it's real. I kind of feel like, you know, there's parts of our country or the world that they like block off and there's a reason. And, and being that you were just in the desert, that's a very magical place. And Mm -hmm. if they're going to live anywhere, why not Palm Springs? (laughs) Why not? And why not catch a show at Caesar's palace? (laughs) Yeah. So I'm saying it's probable. I'm saying, I'm saying his story is probably real. All right. Yeah, for me, I don't know. I I have a lot of problem with how much information he has. That's 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 bugging me. It's it's you if Why? you because he's dig- not special enough. Well, if you dig- yeah, it, it's part of it. It it but like he doesn't have a high enough rank. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're talking to generals. They're looking down on everybody else. But yet he's privy to so much information. He has a lot of information. I've I've gone over a few interviews, quite a few interviews that he's done either via email or sit down and talk or the video ones. Right. And they, 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 get, they, ask, they ask questions and he's got like an answer for almost everything. I mean, now, granted, now her, her, he does say a lot like, I can't be sure about this or I, I don't have any information on this and my only information is based off this personal experience of one time. But it's like he's always got a, he's always got an answer and it's, and the, he's got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of information on, on this species of being so it's it's almost like it's it's too much of a good thing without being briefed like at least at least bob lazar said he was briefed and to have that much 
Really and then he he Pablo Sarr is not a friend. Say I don't know, yeah. or they didn't tell me that. Right, and it's and with Pablo Sarr, you I got that. that feeling that they were being super secretive and that they were going, hey, don't fucking say anything. Or with, you aren't allowed to know that. Right. Or but with Hall, that, they're that just kind of good... like whatever, and he's tagging along, listening to these conversations with general four star, three star, and one star generals and shit, and and th- he's just like in the background. Every so time, devil's Listen. advocate. Maybe they hadn't had anybody that had that kind of contact with them, and maybe they were kind of like riding it out. Yeah, well, there was an, another one where he had a quote where they he overheard him saying that no, he's special. Teacher's pet is special. You can't kill him because if you kill him, we can't replace him. So, but <sighs> but still, it, it's it, it's it's so much. If you're looking through it. Believe me, I've found so many things where he's just answering these questions like, how the hell did you know that? Like, Range 4 Harry, did you know, took him on a personal tour of the damn um, scout craft. Where he said, so, okay. he said he made observations. He was like, because he asked him about um, repairing their scout craft. And he was like, yeah, that in the books, he describes that many of the items like the seats and overhead compartments still carried the mold markings of various brands like american industry and boeing and lockheed and it's like they had overhead compartments like a passenger jet and they used you know what i mean (laughs) yeah our stuff and it's like that just those are really it's like you have this information and it's weird you know some of this is just weird like he knew that they bought $600,000 worth of children's clothes from Sears stores in a warehouse in Los Angeles, California. And he picked it up on a government truck. These are words right out of his mouth. Okay, I'm going to tell you this, though. If you're going to get $600,000 worth of clothes, you pick them up in Los Angeles. At the Sears store. Hey, there's a... There is a fashion district... (laughs) <laughs> all, right. all fashion goes through LA. I'm just saying, yeah. devil's advocate. Right. Yeah. All like literally, Levi's, all that shit goes through Los Angeles. Like there's there's the garment district. Mm-hmm. There's like uh I worked at a mortgage company for a long time. Upstairs was seven jeans. Yeah. And one day my boss is like, hey, there are seven jeans is having the building told us to tell you guys. And I get that. And you know what? He probably was aware of that too, though. Maybe. You Maybe. If, I mean? you lived, if you there, lived in Los Angeles, you would know that. Yeah. You'd be aware of that. So it was like, um, there's a reference to Harry Truman too, again, that apparently, did you hear about this one? That Did you hear about Truman seeing Abraham Lincoln's ghost? No, I did not. Okay, so apparently Harry Truman at one point mistakenly believed he had seen the ghost of President Abraham Lincoln. And that's what they told the story as, is that he saw the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. And and what it really was, was one of the tall whites. Oh, okay. (laughs) All right. So, but there, but there's these, like I said, he's got, he's got just tons of information that he knows about conversations he's ever heard now granted he did say he spent over two years there you know what i mean but you can't figure a lot of that didn't happen right away you know? well he said it was like kind of the first six months nothing it was like here and there and it was like he thought he was hallucinating right so like here's another question by um, the, the, he got asked, did you ever hear of the tall whites taking officers to Mars or any other planet on one of their shuttles? He said, yes, one occasion was described to in my answer above. There was a, there were a number of occasions that um, I'm not able to describe in this email is what his answer was. So he like, he had this information about trips that they were taking soldiers on and one of them was like to the moon and back and he only knew that because he was gauging the direction that the ship took off at and Mm -hmm. what um uh 
phase the moon was in. But they went to the moon and came back and the generals were all laughing and guffawing when they got off the spacecraft. And it was like, there's, I mean, there's just so many. And he's talking about space and how they move through space and their their suits and their their weapons and what they do and don't do. And and it's like you have... Apparently they have really fly clothes too because... Right. Not all light. <laughs> yeah. And they can hover. <laughs> right. And they hover. And then he knows about them trying to make a deal with giving them exoplanets and stuff like that. So it's so it's so much. It's like it's How too good to be true. It it's like too good to be true. Like because there's all right. Well, let's, so much let's, let's so let's here's go back I, to what I said. Do you think it's like a trip? Well, I, I think that's a possibility that it was something that they were the military was doing to him, and that he was seeing these things, and um, because he he like he described what it as I think like is dismissing what happened was what he described to his wife, what he would have would have said this whatever it was three months after they got married where he said, I had these encounters with aliens. Right. She kind of blew it off from what she said. Right. Like he said, she just kind of blew it off. He told him he had this encounters with aliens. Well, I think what he told her right then was what he saw. And then I think what he did was he started writing this story. And he started writing a story and he was taking the, the weird shit he did see and he glorified it more and more and more. Now, and she enabled that. She enabled it later on down the road because she was like, this is brilliant. You should write this. This all happened to you. This is incredible. And because he first had it written as a fiction. I have a problem with that too. Like he wrote it and sold it as a fiction. And then later his fourth book, it was like he gave up on hiding names and places and blah, blah, blah. And people fact checked as I said, his distances and all that stuff. And they, they were like, wow, he's incredibly accurate. Well, yeah, that was kind of part of his job. So he's also a mathematician and this nuclear physicist and he's, he's pretty, he's pretty smart dude. You know what I mean? Right. And I but then think, why go rogue? Cause I think he just like, he, he fantasizes it so much that like, and then when it hit as a success, it kind of, that kind of it's took over. Kind of, it's just kind of, and he kind of combo. rode the wave. Now, it's a weird combo to have a very scientific person be a dreamer that doesn't want to be considered a nerd anymore. Well, it's yeah, not but that it's just far fed. I mean, even just, Bob Lazar just, could be guilty of that. Like, you know, it's weird that no, it's weird that a scientific person, right, is a dreamer. And what I mean by that is like that you can like make up a story because it literally goes against the fabric of their thought process and what makes them what they are. Not if it was a challenge to them to make it super accurate by Maybe. all the knowledge that they knew. You know what but I mean? But I'm like, just saying it puts him Because they know very, if they start stepping out of line, somebody's going to check them. It like, puts him in a very small group. Yes. But but I, I, I'm, I'm saying that as an example of something that may have occurred if it was like a hallucinogenic project. He believes he saw these things. Then he over fantasized them when he was writing about them. And then the dream became reality when he got popular for okay. it. And right. he kind of probably even convinced himself that some of this was true. I think that that's, that's probably what it is. Now, having said all that, I don't for one second disclude that there could be and have been aliens living on this planet unbeknownst to us. You just don't think he saw him. I just don't know if that's the guy that saw him. Okay. And I think maybe if there was, I, I, I just, just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't jive for me, especially with the way he talks about how they act. The way they act doesn't. It seems like, uh, it, that would make sense if they told him, well, we didn't invent this technology. We found it, or it was given to us. Yeah. You know what I mean? I then, mean, then then that story about how they act would make more sense to me because I don't think you get to that level without going through all those trials and tribulations and realizing what had, you've done and done right and done wrong. And I had a hard time with them going to Vegas. 
That was a big problem with me too. He said he saw him at because e- either they do it all the time, mm-hmm. or they and they kill it. <laughs> yeah, he says it's just like a one isolated, or they're just not interested in that. Yeah, there's there was the uh, what was the casino? He said one of them went there because he ordered food, but it didn't appear to eat it. Caesars. No, it was uh, another one. There was another one that was before it was remodeled. I guess and maybe unless that became Caesars. Okay. I can't remember what he said the damn name of that that casino was. <laughs> it was, but it was like. But like, yeah, that oh, that, that was always pro- like a problem for me because like I've been all over Las Vegas. It's, I love it. It's my favorite city, but it's it's fake. Mm-hmm. It's it. I mean, I know it. I know it because I've seen it. Like. I just can't imagine an evolved species. Like, I don't gamble there anymore. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm a peon on the universe scale. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But I can't imagine being an evolved being and then... Oh, Aladdin, the old Aladdin casino. Oh, okay. He said before it was remodeled. And there was a tall white who was a guard. Um... It, it, he was a guard back at the base for the mm-hmm. tall whites. He, rec- he, went, he recognized him and he recognized that he was sitting behind him in his suit. He was wearing a disguise. He was wearing black formal suit and sunglasses even though it was nighttime. He was like, but that wasn't unusual for Las Vegas. That <laughs> isn't. I was giving that. So. Well, I don't know. I So I think like, I think like, I, 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 and they're, for all there may be tall white aliens living right where he said they are you know what i mean and maybe he caught a glimpse of them once or twice you know but he didn't maybe have these he didn't have this crazy amount of interactions with them i mean mm-hmm. it's a crazy amount when you start reading it some is. of these interviews it is and it here is. and especially if you listen to it's like a day, every day I actually like, listened to a few of his, uh, the ends of his, because he'd go to these conferences, like we'd say, and he'd tell his story, and then Q&A. they would do a Q&A, and I've listened to a lot of those Q&As, and they would ask him, and it's like he's got an answer almost for everything. Right. You know what I mean? And and he was saying stuff that it's like, and even though he's consistent, it doesn't mean anything to me, because he's a smart man. Right. If he wasn't a so smart man, then it was like... Okay, well, he couldn't be that consistent because he's kind of no ass. He's going to fuck up somewhere. But smart people, you know what I mean? Especially somebody that spent 18 years writing a book. He's got that shit down. He spent 18 yeah, years perfecting that motherfucker. And this wasn't a story from the beginning. It, it became a story so later. I, don't, I think it's a fantasized story from some kind of actual event. Whether that makes it's sense. real or whether it's real or not, yeah, there was some event that that triggered him to that makes do sense. what he's doing. But I, I, and it could very well be that there's these tall white aliens that live in the desert, and that's what he's basing it off of. It could very well be that none of them exist, and he was given hallucinogens. But I just don't see it as being, I spent two years just chilling with these motherfuckers and hanging out. We were homies by the end of it. Right. And, I get that. And, uh, and, and, cause he, and he even, and I think, I think he's protecting himself by saying that they always were on edge and wanted to kill him, even though he was in with them. So that it keeps a distance of space. So he doesn't have to have too much a part of them, you know, where it's like, right. You know what I mean? Why? Well, why wouldn't they still be contacting you? Well, yeah, there was at all them. times they wanted to kill me, you know what I right. mean? So it's easy to yeah, that's, pass that's, those things off. Like, yeah, well, uh, you're right. They... You're right about that on a story standpoint, for sure. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's done a couple of clever things to distance himself from them. And one of them was, well, was, now you yeah. turned me. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was that. No, I don't it was believe e- it. <laughs> easily killed. <laughs> and then uh, there was a, there was a couple other things that that, that protect him against um, critics. Critics, yeah. So, like, um, he doesn't have to explain how they how they survive. Like, as far as uh, food, because he's always been really weird about when they asked about food he's like well once again i've never seen them eat 
I, I knew that they ate this kind of food. And one time I saw um, on a craft, scout craft, what looked like thick mushroom pudding in a bag, in a sealed plastic bag. And he goes, so I figured that was obviously prepared by the whites themselves and it was for their food. And it's like, but he's he's doing that so that He's, they're like, what do they eat? He's like, well, the three ninety nine tea man. Right. You ever, you ever been Vegas. sitting with like? <laughs> you ever been standing out fucking by a fire with like five buddies, and you got to take a leak? What do you do? You just turn around and you walk a few feet and you fucking take a leak, <laughs> right? So if he's spending in this much time with them and hanging out, at some point they would have had to excuse themselves to relieve themselves. You would think. Something. If they're eating, you know what I mean? And it, at some point, they'd have to eat, too. And Why would they keep that secreted from him? And I think it's just so that he didn't have to mess with a whole new range of questions. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, you start getting into diet, and that's, well, you know, are they killing to eat? Are they? Did they wipe out their planet's food supply? Are they stealing our food? Are they, you know what I mean? Do we have to worry about this? Do we have to worry about that? You know, and it's, and it's, uh, well... You know what I mean? So it gets it's gets convenient. Weird. Yeah. So all right. Well, I guess we're indecisive. And I think, and I think, I think he snuck that. I think he snuck that Easter egg that nobody's. No, I don't know. I haven't seen anybody do it. Do the association, but I think he stuck that little easy. And he's just waiting for somebody to pick up on it. Is that them taking so many children's clothes and adult clothes and food that. Doesn't seem like they need it, but he it's put it, something. He put it in like they they always were transporting and trading. They were using this kind of like a way station, and is how he kind of said it. You know what I mean? And it's like right. you said that not long after you told us about the military making a deal for exoplanets, right? You know what I mean? And I I think he's waiting for somebody to put the two and two together. So that he can be like, yeah, they probably are populating another planet with human beings, but I wouldn't know. You know what I mean? Right. And and it, it's 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 just it's you a, get, the only my only devil's advocate to what you're saying is that you could be a screenwriter and make way more money than that. He, I don't know if he cares about the money as much as he does about being popular. You could, be, just, you could be way, way more popular. You be, that's the, that's some Steven Spielberg stuff. I mean, it's a, like, it's a good story, man. It's a great story. Even when you, it, I've, I've told, and I want, I'm gonna end up reading them. My wife has the books. I'm gonna end up mm-hmm. reading them um, because they say it's 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 a good read. Like you could read it if you were a non-believer or a believer, is what his wife said. And that well, then, one that one's stuck in the crawl too. It's like so. Maybe we'll do a follow up. Mm-hmm. Read the books. Read the books. We'll do a follow up, but I think right now we're indecisive. We're indecisive, and I'm not. And like, I wanted to make it clear, I'm not. I'm leaning. That. I'm leaning more the other way, and you're leaning more that it's it didn't happen. I, I'm leaning more that he believes something happened, whether or not that was chemically induced yeah. or it happened. And right. You're leaning more towards nothing happened, whether it was chemically induced or nothing happened. Well, no, I'm saying he. There was some basis for this. Something did happen, whether it was hallucinogens or actual sightings or or just misinterpretations of sightings. He might have saw something that he didn't see, and all the rumors and all the stuff that went around about like Range Four Harry and all that stuff. It got to him. You know what I mean? But because our, our friend that. Their, his students put acid in his coffee mm-hmm. he told me flat out I thought I was losing my mind yeah and that's kind of what this guy said right he, he like over and over he's like I mm-hmm. was constantly checking myself like maybe I didn't see that and whatever you know yeah, and the story and the the way people interact with him and the way he's talking about interacting with people on the base is very odd. It's it's just very odd behavior. To me. When he said that he he was he was like rolling on the ground laughing, yeah, it's weird. That's a weird reaction to somebody saying, "Hey, there's a radioactive horse that floats over the desert." I wouldn't roll on the ground laughing. 
Right. I just be like, you guys are idiots. Yeah. Now, according to him, see, now he's got follow up. He has information about why they saw a horse. Because when they travel in a group out in the desert, it looks like a horse. It looks like a fucking horse. And I'm like, God damn, he's got it. He's got information on everything. Everything. Right. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's too much for me. It's too much of a good thing, I guess you could say. It's like one of those things where it's like, you, you, you have too much. There's no way that you would be allowed to just walk free, like without, if they're keeping this so secret. Right. Because, because literally like the way he describes the aliens is if they get crossed at all by humans, they will wipe us the fuck out. Which makes sense. So it would be <laughs> in the best interest of the the Air Force to keep everybody shutting the fuck up about it. Yeah. You know, and here's you got this guy's running off doing book promos. Having people look at Google Earth. You know people are going there trying to snoop around. I do you know it right now. So that's I, for me it's like uh, I, I, I think the government would have done a better job of trying at least trying to cover it up. Do some Bob Lazar stuff, destroy the guy's life, you know what I mean? Or something, you know? Right. Or or come out and say you were given hallucinogens. Here's a half a million dollars. We're sorry. You know what I mean? Even if it was yeah. aliens. Sure. <laughs> you know, so and then nobody would believe it. You know, you'd be like, well, well the government just said they gave you drugs. You're like, but they didn't. <laughs> yeah. Tough shit, bud. You know? Hmm. That'd be a that'd be an easy way for the government to just get rid of them. It wouldn't cost them that much money comparatively to what they spend on dumb shit. You know what I mean? Right. No, I'm, you, I'm with you. You give them a couple million and say, "Hey, we're sorry. We gave you hallucinogens. That's why you thought you saw all white people." <laughs> <laughs> you know, tripping, you tripping balls, my man. <laughs> right. Right. So I don't all think right. there was any attempt to shut him up, and I just don't. That's. None of that stuff jives with me, and it's and it's so it's impossible for me to believe in. Uh, not and like I said, not that I um, don't Just believe. Go to the story. Don't but. I don't I believe totally that it's there in the possibility of extraterrestrials existing here on this planet without us knowing. And but, you, you agree with that? Maybe what his encounters had either some kind of psycho like psychedelic or even real. some sort of origin. Could it could even been in my mind? It could have been real. He could have saw the tall whites. He just the rest of the story. It could have been like a once or twice thing where he saw Range Four Harry, you know, the horse as the group traveling, whatever. And I think he fantasized the rest. I think he spent a long time writing a very good story. But I, 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 I still feel like it was based off real stuff because m- several other officers have been that they've they've been able to. There's people that have been in anonymity. An, how do you say that? Anonymity have talked about um, some of this stuff, but not to his depth in any shape or form. Just like random sightings or that I got this eerie feeling something was following me and I thought I saw a flash of white. I guess we would like you kind of turned me because I guess now I'm kind of (laughs) inconclusive. (laughs) (laughs) Although I do think he encountered something. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. I think something did happen. It's kind of like the Zimbabwe children. Mm hmm. Maybe not as strong, but oh, yeah. something happened to him out there. Right. Um, like I said, they, they say that there's a few other people that said that they had these experiences or whatever, sure. but sure. they were like, just like a flash behind them or an eerie feeling or something that they couldn't figure out across the desert sky or something like that. Right. But, but nobody was like, yeah, I was hanging out with them in the fucking tool shed. It was, well, he also explained like, if you're with somebody... And you both see the same thing. You're like, did you see that? But if you're mm-hmm. by yourself, and I, I can see that too. Like, you know, I was even with Stephanie one time. And we saw, like, 
out of the top of our sunroof, <laughs> we saw like this crazy, I, I don't know, UFO or whatever you want to call it. It did like a, like a, like an M, like an M zigzag in the sky. Zip, zip, <laughs> zip, 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 boom, gone. I'm like, you see that? Yeah, She's right. Like, yeah, I, I saw that. What is that? What was that? Why did it do that? Because it, it covered a lot of ground. Just like spatially looking at it. You know, it covered a lot of ground. What is that? And uh, we, we didn't have like an explanation for it. So like, I don't know. I He saw something. But I think it's inconclusive to say whether or not he saw the tall weights, right? Yeah, I think he saw, I think something happened to him and I think he fantasized the rest and and he wrote a fiction novel and then when he realized that it would uh, pass over as fiction, non-fiction, that's that's what he built it as later on. Yep. But, you know, it's it's another one of those ones where it's like, I want want it to be true. I want it to be true, but... But I just don't know if it is or not. I, I leave room for it to be true, but I, not him. I just don't. <laughs> I just don't. It's too much, man. It's too much. I mean, he's yeah. Like, yeah. The more I look at some of these interviews and stuff, the more quotes I see from him, the more I'm like, ah, oh, come on, man. Right. Like now they're like, no, he's like, I don't know about the proportions, but I did see him working on it once, and it's like, right. ah. and they were like, they're using fiber optic lines. That's what they were giving them a bunch of fiber optic lines. I'm like, I don't know. If, I feel that's like a, that's well, they should be past that. <laughs> it feels like it. it feels like it. you know, it's like a thousands of miles of fucking cable. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> like well, we couldn't get the satellite dish mounted on the roof. It um, wasn't pointing southeast. Yeah, it's so. Uh, anyway, I just think he's. I think it's a far too far fetched, and I, I, I don't. I don't. I think something did happen. He did have some experience, but I do not think it was no anywhere near the level of what he wrote. All right, so right now we're going to say it's inconclusive. We're both mm-hmm. going to read the books, right? And then maybe we will revisit this in a short one. Yep. Okay. That's cool. Well, so yeah. inconclusive. Inconclusive. All right, then. I'm Anthony. I'm Brandon. And this is Everything That's Weird. For show notes and merchandise, go to www.everythingthatsweird.com. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And be sure to like, subscribe, and review anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening. See you next time.